Bibles this morning to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. This passage has been on my heart for the last couple of weeks, and especially this week. We talked about it in our men's meeting on Wednesday night, and I've heard others talk about it through the week. And so I believe it is one that the Lord is drawing our attention to. Psalm 91. And it's 17, I mean, I'm sorry, it's 16 verses. Uh, It's a very important psalm that we need to take to heart, read, and even memorize. I know you just sat down, you rested for about a minute. But let's all stand again in honor of God's Word. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. You can follow along on the screen, or you can follow along in your Bibles. This psalm reads this way. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Do I get an amen? Amen. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. And I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It comforts us. It inspires us. And it strengthens us. And so, Lord, I ask you now... To let the words of this psalm, Lord, bring forth faith today. Lord, help us not to just read the words and say amen. But Lord, help us to do what it says. And Lord, I pray that now you would give me the words to say. Lord, I pray that you would give us all eyes to see and ears to hear and a heart to understand the Word of God today. And I pray, Lord, that when we go out of here today, Lord, we will be confident in the Lord our God. Father, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you. You may be seated. This passage has particular application to us today in light of the trouble that has come to our nation and to the world. Right now, we are in a declared crisis. It's called a pandemic. And that pandemic has created fear. And fear has caused people to panic. And people have done crazy things. I never thought I'd see the day where the stores would run out of toilet paper. Hand sanitizer. People buying up all kinds of things. Lord, you know, it, it would, it's almost a reminder of other things like Y2K and 
things like that. People are just staying in and not going anywhere, and that may be good for family time. Maybe more meals cooked at home around the table. That's a good thing. Amen? But fear. Fear is an enemy. Fear is not from God. Now, the fear of the Lord is a healthy fear, and that is a reverential fear knowing that one day we're going to stand before Him and give account. We all need that kind of fear. But fear can become irrational. We can get paranoid. We get to the place where we don't want to touch anything, go anywhere, do anything, and as a result, we, we're in a prison, a prison that God didn't put us in. And one of the things that's caused people to panic is because this virus uh, supposedly spreads quickly, and, and so people are doing everything they can to keep it from spiking, and I understand that, and we need to cooperate with whatever uh, things our government says should be done. They're trying to look out for us, even like a parent would tell a child, don't go out in the street. You know, well, nothing's going to hurt me, nothing's going to hit me, but, you know, the reality is parents are trying to give you some wisdom, right? And so our government is trying to help us. We need to cooperate. We need to do what we can from a practical standpoint. But we don't need to do it because we're afraid. We don't need to be controlled by fear. We don't need to panic. And not only is it the virus, but now people are panicking over our health care system. The two things I think everybody cares about in our nation is our health care system, because everybody wants to be well and healthy, and two, our economy. And for whatever reason, this one thing has affected both. It's affected both, which in some ways, I look at it as if there is a silver lining in this, is that it reminds us how vulnerable we are without God. We live our lives presuming that we're in control. And we are not in control. We're not in control of making it home today. We're not in control of whether our heart's going to beat throughout the day. We're not in control of viruses. We're not in control of the economy. We're not in control of our health care system. We're not in control of any of those things. And so fear begins to grip our heart when we seem to lose control. All right. So the question, I guess, begins to be asked, how is this going to affect our lives? And it does affect our lives. It affects our normal routine. There are schools not having school this week. There are governments that are uh, even local, he, locally right here that are shutting down uh, certain things to say we're not going to open those things up. And there are churches that have decided, and I'm not judging one, or, one way or the other, but for whatever reason, they're not having churches. It's affected people at every level. People are not making trips that they normally would make. And our life is changing. People who can't fly overseas like they were before. People can't come in like they were before. And so life is changing. We don't know how long all these regulations will be enforced, but we do know this, that we have a choice to make. Whether we're going to be controlled by fear and panic, or whether we're going to have peace in the midst of it all. And I want to tell you today, peace is a much better place to be. Don't be controlled by fear and by panic. Have peace in your heart. Now I want to talk about panic versus peace. Panic, the very word panic, came from a Greek god name. His name was Pan. Pan. Uh, he was the god of pastures, flocks, and shepherds. He's represented as having legs, horns, and ears of a goat. He was able to cause mental and emotional distress and induce men to flee in unreasonable fear. Well, that Pan is not a real god. But the feelings that I just described are real. People experience that unreasonable fear. Where there is no danger, in fact, that kind of panic is when 
there's a fire that breaks out in a building and people run out the building and trample over and there's more people killed in the trampling than there are even the danger endangered by the fire. Because people are controlled by an unreasonable fear. They have just gone over the top and it's irrational. Well, the definition of panic is a sudden, unreasoning terror, often accompanied by mass flight and extreme measures to protect property. Well, that's a pretty good definition there. But the essence of panic is fear. Fear is the root of panic. And so fear is the opposite of faith. And so what we have to choose is between fear and faith. Now, fear does not deny that there is some danger. Dangers are all around us. Right? I mean, you took a risk by coming to church today, and not just because of anything going on in our, na in our nation, but because any time you get in your car to get out on the road, you're taking a risk. Right? <laughs> yeah, and, and some of you have realized the hand of God has intervened and kept you in some situations. There's risk in just w waking up and get having another day. There's risk every time you go to the grocery store. There's risk when you eat food at your favorite restaurant. There's, there's risk when you shake hands. There's risk all around us. Those risks have always been there, but there comes a time where we panic and those fears that we lived with faith before and overcame with our faith, suddenly we throw faith out the window and fear overwhelms us. I hope today that you're not living in fear. I hope you're not living with a panic in your heart. You see, that root of fear is, in, is insecurity. Insecurity. We're insecure. We're not sure what tomorrow is going to hold. We're not sure if we're going to be okay. We're insecure. But faith, the root of that is security. Security. So the question is, where are you finding your security? And if you can find your security in one who is able to hold you in the midst of whatever you're going through, then it doesn't matter what you go through. It doesn't matter whether it's this or an atomic bomb or some kind of war overseas or whatever it is, when you find your security in the one who is the rock, when the storms come, the house still stands. When the plague comes and the wind blows and the cloud of that plague blows away, you're still standing. You see, you've got to know where your security comes from. And I want to encourage you today to get your eyes off of finding security with what men do and find your security in God. Find your security in God. Now, where does peace come from? Well, I just said peace comes from God. He is the God of peace. Uh, Philippians 4.9 says, the, God, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace. He will be with you. Now he says, if you will do these things. So we got to go back and find out what those things are. And I hope you will. We don't have time to do that right now. But he says, if you do these things that you've learned and received and heard and saw by example, he said, the God of peace will be with you. I want the God of peace to be with me. I want the God of peace to be with you. I want the peace of God to be on, with our nation. Amen? And now is a time for those who know their God to trust in their God. If not, then where is our God? And if not, why are we trying to witness to a world to trust in God that we don't trust in? So, peace comes from God. Also, peace comes through Jesus Christ. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to have peace. Not real peace. Not lasting peace. 
The war is going on in your soul. Struggles are going on in your marriage. Struggles are going on in your family. Struggles are going on at work. There is no peace. But for those who know Jesus Christ, there's a peace that comes. And He gives us peace. Listen to John 14, 27. He said, peace I leave with you. Now Jesus was going away. But He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now Jesus is saying, I'm going away, and I'm sure that if Jesus were present, and there was whatever virus going through, you would think, okay, I'm good, Jesus is here. <laughs> you know, even if I start to cough, Jesus is he's right here. All he's got to do is just say, be healed, and, I, and I'm good. But I'm going away, he says. I'm going away. Now, that could create fear. That might create some panic. So Jesus said this. He said, I'm leaving you my peace. I'm leaving you my peace. I give it to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Because see, if the world gives you peace, and, and it might on a broadcast today say, well, things are looking better. And so you feel a little more peaceful because you, you believed what they said. But the next day says, oh, that was a false report. Things are twice as bad as they were even this morning. Suddenly your peace is taken away because if the world gives you that peace, the world can take it away from you. But if Jesus gives you that peace, then the world can't take it away from you. You can have peace in the midst of the storm. Now you can have you can speak peace to the storm like Jesus did on the water, or you can have peace in the midst of the storm like Paul had in the book of Acts. Because God had said to him, you're going to, be, you're going to make it. And so it doesn't matter what the storm says and what it, the threatening says, Paul had that assurance that we're all going to make it. He had peace in his heart, even though the storm was raging all around him. And so we don't need to be controlled by the circumstances. We need God's peace. Peace comes from a heart and mind that is stayed on the Lord. And therein is the real discipline. A heart and mind that stayed on the Lord. Because our minds can begin to think about the things that we can't control. Just like Peter, remember, stepping out of the boat. The water was stormy. Jesus comes walking on the water. Peter says, Lord, bid me come so that I can walk on the water. Jesus said, come. Peter stepped out. And as long as he kept his faith on Jesus, he was doing the impossible. What no one said could happen. He was walking on the water. But then he began to get his mind and heart off of the Lord, and he began to look at the wind and the waves. He was an experienced fisherman. He knew exactly what this meant, and he also knew this is impossible in the natural. And so when he began to look upon those things, doubt began to set in, and he began to sink. So we need to keep our mind and heart on the Lord. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace, that word perfect peace is actually peace, peace. It's double peace. You will keep him in perfect peace or peace, peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. He does what? He trusts in you. And therefore, he's keeping his mind on the Lord because he trusts in him. He's looking to the Lord. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be anxious for nothing. And this is a good one for today because people, a lot of anxiety out there. Fear, worry, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, everybody say everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, and thanksgiving is an expression of our faith that God has heard our prayers. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, everybody say the peace of God, 
which surpasses understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You see, Jesus isn't asking us to deny there's a problem. He wants us to bring the problem to Him. He wants us not to worry, but in everything through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, thanking Him for hearing our prayer, thanking Him for taking care of us, to let those requests be made known. And so now as we put it in His hand, we can have peace, the peace of God that rules and reigns in our hearts. John 16, These things, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. That peace comes in Jesus. In the world you will have tribulation. That means trials, difficulties, whatever. He says, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In other words, don't be sad, but be happy. Be of good cheer. Have joy in your heart, knowing whose you belong to, whose you are, and who belongs to you. Be joyful. Keep your joy in the midst of the trial. Now, in Psalm 91, which is our passage today, I want to point out some different promises. And these promises I've, I've put within uh, one, two, three, four, five categories. Five categories. And various ones throughout here I have put together into those categories. You may break it up a little bit different. In fact, I've done that in the past. I have a different way I've laid it out to, to express a different theme. But five different categories of promises. I want to point these out to you today. Psalm 91 is a wonderful, wonderful uh, psalm of promises. First of all is the promise of His preservation. All of these are with P's. The promise of His preservation. Psalm 91.3 says, Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. That's His preservation. 91 verse 9 and 10 says, Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. That's preservation. That's preservation. Psalm 91, 15. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble, and I will deliver him and honor him. That's preservation. We have promises that God will preserve us. Look, folks, we are vulnerable in ourselves. When, when you go out anywhere, you're vulnerable. Even being at home, you're vulnerable. We're more vulnerable than we realize. We need a God who can watch over us. He is the great shepherd who's watching over the sheep. And the sheep, let's face it, we are His sheep, and that's not really a compliment. Because sheep are sort of dumb. For them to survive, they need a shepherd. They cannot defend themselves against wolves and lions and bears and thieves. They will eat things they don't need to eat. And they will wander off into places they don't need to wander off. Sheep are pretty dumb. And so, we need a shepherd. And we have a shepherd. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. He said, and I shall not want. And, and it says that even through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For His rod and His staff, they comfort me. I know I'm under His watchful care. And even the things I'm not aware of, the dangers around me, He's watching over me. Just like a parent does a small child. That child's running around and he just thinks he's invincible. But he doesn't realize he's got a parent that's there watching to make sure they don't run off into that place or that place or get this in their mouth. They're constantly watching. And so the child's just going around with no fear, completely oblivious to his vulnerability or her vulnerability, not realizing that God put a parent in their life to watch over them. 
in their vulnerability. We have a shepherd. Thank God we have a shepherd. He's watching over me. I look back through my life and I can see his hand of providence carrying me through the difficulties of life. One day we'll get to heaven and our eyes will be fully opened and we'll realize just how hard our angels worked. Right? We'll realize just how many times God delivered us from plagues and difficulties that we weren't even aware of. Situations and wrecks and explosions and fires and all kinds of things. We'll, we'll realize one day, we'll have to do a lot of apologizing to our angels. Forgetting them and having to make them work so hard. Psalm 91.16 says, With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. With long life. That's preservation for a lifetime. Preservation for a, lof- for a lifetime. And salvation. And next, not only is the promise of his preservation, but the promise of his protection. His protection. We're vulnerable. Not Psalm 91.1 He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Just like a, a hen gathers her chicks under her wings to, for protection. And those little chicklets are running around under those wings. They're protected. Now, it's not saying God has feathers and wings, but it is showing us a metaphor that we are under His wings. We are under His care. Thank God we're under His care. Hallelujah. Psalm 91, 4, And He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. We're talking about protection. Look at verse 11 and 12. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Praise God. Not only is God watching after you, but he has given his angels charge over us. Some people have talked about guardian angels. Jesus talks about the little ones, that their angels are before the presence of the Lord. I believe there are angels assigned to each and every one of us. And God has given them charge to watch over us. Thank God for the angels that do His bidding. Hebrews, the last verse of Hebrews 1 says about the angels, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who are heirs of salvation? In other words, the angels are working on our behalf to deliver us, to help us, to strengthen us. We're not alone, people. We're not alone. When you walk into a dangerous place, if the Lord is with you, then who can be against you? If God is for us, then who can be against us? Amen? Now, that... Verse there, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they will bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. Sometimes people get presumptuous. And peace is not a license to be presumptuous. God's protection is not a license to be presumptuous. What do I mean by that? Well, Jesus was led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, Matthew 4 and Luke 4. And out in the wilderness, the devil tempted Jesus. You remember the temptations of Jesus? And the devil brought Jesus up on top of a pinnacle of the temple. And he told him, just jump down. Just jump down. The Bible says... That he will give his angels charge over you lest you hit your foot against a stone. Show yourself to the world who you are. There was a belief in that day, from what I understand, that the Messiah would come out of heaven. 
and descend into the temple. What a better way to show who you are to the world than just come down in a supernatural way so everybody oohs and awes and goes, this must be the one. And Jesus turned to him and he said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Did you know the devil is a scripture quoting devil? But the devil never uses the word, the scripture in context. And he will use it actually to lead people astray. There are people in cults right now who the devil has led astray by misapplying scripture. And so what he was saying, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And so what was he saying, tempt the Lord your God? What does that mean? That means to try to make God do something to prove himself to you. It would be like me saying, I want to prove that I'm a man of faith. I'm going to go up here to the courthouse. I'm going to climb up on top of the building. I'm going to call everyone that's around. And I'm going to jump off this building based upon this promise. Okay. Well, I can guarantee you, if I were to tempt the Lord that way, I would hit the ground. Would it be God's fault? No. But if I were in a dangerous situation and something occurred, I could be assured of this. His angels are there to watch over me. If I were to stumble and fall in a time of accident or whatever, that God is there to help me. And I've heard many stories about people who were delivered in a, supernaturally in an explosion or a fall. We used to have a man in our church years ago who worked on these high towers where you go up way up there working on these towers and cables. God bless those people who are willing to do that. But there was a, a cable hoist down on the ground that ran up to a pulley and it would pull them up and the guy used a, a spud wrench if anybody's been in construction you know what a spud wrench is to try to get that cable lined up he was a new guy and when he did it snapped the cable and he fell and by the grace of God with nothing to hang on to just free falling a knife clip on his belt snagged onto one of the beams. And he was hanging by that knife belt hundreds of feet up in the air. And you know, he still had injuries. But he was alive. That was a testimony of God's intervention. And we've seen God do that on many occasions. And so, we don't want to presume upon the promises of God's Word to try to force God to prove Himself to us or to others. But those promises are there in our time of need. Amen? They're there in our time of need. We should take proper precautions with what we can control, but then trust God with what we cannot control. So is it good to wash your hands? Yeah, you should wash your hands all the time. Amen? I mean, if anything, we're, we're learning to be more diligent about things we should have already been doing. Okay? Sometimes we have a little accident. We realize, oh, it could have been really, really bad. And now I'm, I'm, I remember now I should have done some I should have taken a certain precaution I didn't I just kind of presumed I was going to be able, and now after that you're going okay from now on I'm going to do it from now on I'm going to do what the precaution says because I'm not going to be presumptuous but I am going to trust God I'm going to do what I have to do but I'm going to trust God with what I cannot control look folks we're living in a world we're not in control of this world we're not in control of the people that come around us. We're not in control of what the economy is going to do. We're not in control of what's going to happen at the hospitals. We're not in control of 
of the stock market. We're not in control of any of those things. But God is in control. So we have the promise of His preservation, the promise of His protection. We also have the promise of His peace. Psalm 91, 5. He says, You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes you shall look and see the reward of the wicked. So he's saying, we're not to live in fear. He said, if you, and, and we're going to talk about what these promises are based on here in a moment. But he's saying there is a place that we can live in where we're not afraid. We're not afraid of those uncertain things. We're not afraid of the things in the dark. We're not afraid of things we cannot control. I, I know when I was a kid, fear... You know, when you turn the lights off at night. I don't know if anybody ever got afraid at night when the lights turned off in your bedroom. Yeah, I just, you know, I remember hearing the little nursery rhyme about Peter and the wolf. Anybody remember Peter and the wolf? Peter and the wolf. And that was such kind of a scary little thing that I heard that story that when, that night when I went to bed, I just knew that wolf was under my bed. And it was one of those things that, that I remember I didn't want to get close to the bed because he might grab me. So I would flip the light off and jump onto the bed. And then I would get right in the middle of the bed in case it was trying to come up from either side. You know what I'm talking about. Now that was panic. That was, that was unreasonable fear. But you know now, I just lay my head down and I thank God He's in control. He's watching over me. He's in charge. Amen? Lay your head down and go to sleep. So peace is knowing that God and His angels are with us and that they are watching over us 24-7, 365, for all of our life. He's in control. He's, and we have that peace. Not only do we have the promise of His preservation, His protection, His peace, but we also have the promise of His power. Psalm 91, 13. He shall, you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Now that takes me over to uh, the, the Gospel of Luke when the, the 70 came back and they were saying, hey, even you know the demons were subject to to us in your name. And Jesus said, you will trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. We're not just left here just to take the devil's shots. To take his hits. We have power. Power that is given to us. And we can exercise that power to make a difference. Where there is a problem, and when there is an issue, that we can come to Him, talking about God, for the power we need to overcome in that situation. Whether it's healing, or deliverance, or whatever the problem is, we have power. That's one of His promises. And finally, we have the promise of His presence. Psalm 91, 15 says, He shall call upon Him, Call, call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. You see, we can have the, the promise of his presence. Jesus said it this way when he left. He said, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You see, he's with me. He's with you. He's with us. And if he is with us, then it doesn't matter what else we face. Whatever challenge, challenges will come. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulations. But He said, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. Now, all those promises are good, but Psalm 91 is not just a magical incantation that you read and think, I'm good now. It hinges upon the first two verses, and I want us to go there. 
the first two verses. The promises of Psalm 91 are for those who, first of all, dwell in the secret place of the Most High. The name of the Lord Most High is El Yon, which is the highest in elevation. There is no one higher than God. Okay? I'm not trusting in a lower God. I am trusting in El Yon, the Most High God. Amen? Those who dwell in the secret place. The secret place in the Old Testament referred to the place of the tabernacle in which the presence of God on earth was residing in the Holy of Holies. Psalm uh, 27 verse 5 talks about that. We're not going to go there today. Jesus in the New Testament applies that secret place to the place of prayer. Folks, we don't have to have a tabernacle in Shiloh, and we don't have to have a temple in Jerusalem to go to to get in the secret place with God. All we got to do is get in the place of prayer. Jesus talked about that in Matthew 6, verse 5 and 6. When you pray, go into your closet, shut the door, and pray to your Father in the secret place. He's talking about spending time in God's presence. Spending time in prayer. And I'm not talking about going in and leaving. We ought to always dwell with God in the secret place. Throughout the day, pray without ceasing. Amen? And in that case, he said, These will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Those who dwell in the secret place of, the, of El Yon. They shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, which is Shaddai. Shaddai means the omnipotent, the all-powerful God. Not only is He the highest God, He is the all-powerful God. Isn't that awesome? So if you dwell in the secret place with El Yom, the Most High, then the, you'll be protected by the all-powerful. Hallelujah. Shaddai. And so in light of that, He says in verse 2, He said, I will say, everybody Say, say. Say has to do with speaking it out. But it has to do with speaking it out in faith. Declaring it in faith. Notice what he says. I will say of the Lord. That word that for the name of God is Yahweh. He is the all-existent one. Past, present, and future. He's always the same. He is the covenant God. He's the covenant God of the promises. He said, I will say of Yahweh, I will say of the Lord, He, Yahweh, is my refuge. Refuge is a place of preservation. What I run to when there's danger. He is my fortress. He's my place of protection. He is my God. Whatever I need, my God is the highest God. My God is the most powerful God. My God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and has given me His promises. He is my God. You are my God, and I in Him will I trust. In that God, I will trust. So what is he saying? All these promises hinge upon those first two verses. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. I want, I want us all to say that together today, those first two verses. And let this be a prayer. I hope that you can memorize this. Quote it. And, hey, quote, learn to memorize all of Psalm 91. Psalm 91. When the crisis comes, you may not have your Bible around. But you can quote it. Let's all say it together. Verse 1 and 2. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Amen? Amen. Now, this week, I read a clip about C.S. Lewis. 
C.S. Lewis was a British writer and lay theologian. He lived from 1898 to 1963, and he wrote many books about... He was an atheist, and through the process of time came to be a believer, and then became, as it were, a philosopher, a, in, a, an apologist of the Christian faith. And one of the books that he, that he wrote uh, was... Uh, a book that had to do with the atomic bomb. A lot of people were afraid of the atomic bomb, nuclear weapons. You know, that was a new threat on the horizon of humanity. I mean, suddenly, cities could be destroyed in an instant. People were panicking over that. And if you go back and read, I mean, people were building atomic bomb shelters and they're coming up with atomic bomb raids, uh, practices, and all kinds of things. There was a fear that was going on as if America was going to be attacked by the Soviet Union. And so this was a very big fear back in those days. And so he wrote this about the atomic bomb, but we can just as much put pandemic in there. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going to read to you what he said. He said, it is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world which also already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. This is the first point to be made and the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we are going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb or pandemic, let that bomb or pandemic, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things, praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint, well, I don't recommend that, and a game of darts. Not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs or pandemics. They may break our bodies, a microbe can do that but they need not dominate our minds. You see what he's saying? Look, we're all going to die one day. And we don't know how we're going to die. It could be an atomic bomb or it might be a pandemic. Whatever it is. But do we, do we become imprisoned in, in, in a prison of fear? Or do we live our lives with wisdom, but in faith? And live with purpose. And be found doing the things Jesus told us to do. Trusting Him for everything we need as we go. Folks, we're not under the circumstances. We have a God who is over the circumstances. We are not presumptuous, but we're not panicking either. We are living in faith. And we're going to help others. So how shall we live? Let me give you seven principles real quick. Combat fear with faith in God and His promises. Combat fear with faith in God and His promises. Stop worrying about what you cannot control. Second, draw near to God in the secret place. Go in there and ask God for His help and His wisdom. Next, profess your faith in the Lord, Yahweh, as your refuge, your fortress, your God in whom you will trust. Make sure that that is an everyday profession. When you get up in the morning, you might even start off with prayer. If you have to send your kids to school or going to work or whatever it is, Maybe just start off with Psalm 91, 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. We're trusting in God today. We're trusting in the Lord today. And so today, go forth knowing He is with you. And then claim God's promises. They're there. He wants us to put faith in His promises. And then don't be presumptuous. Be wise. Take known precautions for the, for the sake of yourself and others. 
Six, find ways to do the work of God in light of the current situation. I'm hearing now of people who are, because they're elderly, who are especially vulnerable, who are taking the extra step to check on the elderly, to go and buy their food and bring it to their home so they don't have to be exposed to the, to the supermarkets and, and other places, to help people who are dealing with some of the repercussions of school closings and other kinds of things, being there as a body to help one another wherever the need arises. Find a way to continue the work of God in light of the current situation. And finally, minister to the weak, the vulnerable, and the affected. Minister to the weak, the vulnerable, and the affected. Get a prayer chain going for people. Cook some soup for somebody. Let them know you care. Hey, give them a phone call. Nothing passes through the phone line that I know of except maybe gossip. Cut that out. That virus is not one we need going through there anyway. Amen? The final benediction as our team comes. It's Paul speaking in 2 Corinthians verse 13 and 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the love and the God of love and peace will be with you. I want to read that again. Finally, brethren, farewell. As we come to a close. Be complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today. Lord, that you are our shepherd. We shall not want. Everything we need is in you. Lord, we live in a world full of tribulations. They're all around us. But you told us to be of good cheer. You have overcome the world. There's nothing too great that you're not greater still. Lord, your presence is with us. Lord, teach us to be wise, but teach us to be people of faith. Lord, and I pray that in a fear-panicked world, Lord, that we will be the anchor of peace. That they will see and say, I want that peace too. Lord, show us how to be your ministers in the season in which our nation is right now. And Lord, help us to believe. Help us to trust in a God who is greater, higher, more powerful and is always there. I pray for those today who do not have peace. Pray for those who are panicked. I pray for those who are in locked in a prison of unreasonable fear in their heart. I pray, Lord, that today that they might run to you, the Prince of Peace, Jesus. And that they might, in surrendering their fears, receive the peace that passes all understanding. I pray for those who don't have peace. Because they don't know you, Jesus. Lord, if they were to die right now, this pandemic thing that's been called would, would not only affect them temporarily, but it would also possibly affect their eternal destiny. They're not ready to die. They're not ready to meet you. They're not ready to stand before you. I pray that today that they might call upon the name of the Lord that they might be saved. They might call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that today will be the day that they do that. In Jesus' name I pray.